Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to review pretty much all the concepts that we've talked about in this playlist. We're going to be looking at the deep muscles of the anterior neck, the intermediate layer, the hyoid layer, and we're going to put all those together and identify these on a bunch of figures. And since we haven't talked about the superficial muscles yet, there's only two of them, and so we're going to actually hit those with origins, insertions, and so on as we go through the video where applicable. Okay, so let's just look at this figure and identify some things that we know. So this is going to be a big IDing video. Now, first of all, some landmarks. Okay, we're looking at an anterior view right here. This bone up here is our mandible. Okay, down here we have the manubrium of the sternum, and then here is our clavicle. Also, right up here is the hyoid bone. So once we peel off the superficial muscles, the hyoid bone is going to be a landmark for the hyoid layer. So we'll know if we're talking about a suprahyoid muscle or an infrahyoid muscle. All right, so first of all, let's go in alphabetical order. Letter A right here. Now, this isn't part of the anterior neck, per se. We can see a little bit of it here, but that's our trapezius muscle. Okay? Uh, recall that the trapezius has some insertion on the clavicle right here, but it's also going to mainly insert on the scapula posteriorly. Letter B right here. This muscle, also not part of the anterior neck musculature, this is levator scapulae. So remember, the levator scapulae is going to originate on some of the upper cervical vertebrae. You can kind of see the muscle kind of heading up that way. And then it's going to descend down here and insert on the superior part of the medial border of the scapula. So it's going to elevate the scapula, levator scapulae. Now letter C is this muscle over here. This is one of our superficial muscles. It's a broad sheet muscle that pretty much, as you can see here, extends all the way up from the mandible down all the way past the clavicle even, and it actually will end up fusing with the superior part of the pectoralis major muscle. This muscle is called platysma, the platysma muscle. So the platysma is one of the two muscles in the superficial layer of the anterior neck musculature. Let's talk about the platysma in a little bit of detail. Its origin is on the subcutaneous tissue of the infraclavicular and supraclavicular regions. What does that mean? Well, first of all, infraclavicular, this is just the region below the clavicle. Supraclavicular is the region above the clavicle. Subcutaneous tissue is really just referring to the region below the dermis and the epidermis, so pretty much the hypodermis and mainly the fascia underneath that. And so it's going to originate from that deep fascia, and then it's going to be in the regions above and below the clavicle. So really the origin of the muscle is going to be all this fascia really in this area right here, right above the clavicle and then below the clavicle. And as I mentioned, uh, the platysma is actually going to, as it descends downward, is actually going to fuse with the pectoralis major muscle partly, okay, particularly the clavicular head. Okay? Now the insertion of the platysma is actually the superior attachment in this case. It's going to be the base of the mandible, skin of the cheek and lower lip, angle of the mouth, and orbicularis oris. To put this simply, really the insertion is going to be, again, the fascia, really just in the mouth and cheek area. Okay, So yes, it's going to be partly on the mandible. It's going to be partly the corners of the mouth, partly the orbicularis oris muscle. Remember that from the uh, facial muscle expression playlist. And so really just this general region around the mouth. Okay. Now, when the platysma contracts, it's of course going to pull the insertion toward the origin. And so we're going to get a movement that looks like this. Okay? So when the platysma contracts, the entire musculature around here in the neck tenses, and it pulls all the skin downwards. Okay? And so you get an expression that looks like this. Usually we consider this to be an expression of fear or some kind of surprise, um, maybe not so much a positive surprise. Okay? Um, so the platysma really is mainly a muscle of facial expression, at least in humans. Okay? So we can say that it draws the corners of the mouth inferiorly and widens it. It's able to widen the mouth because part of the insertion is on the corners of the mouth and the orbicularis oris. And then it draws the mouth inferiorly, and that makes sense because the insertion is being pulled downward toward the origin. And so you have a net movement of the fascia in this direction, but since the fascia is connected to the skin, it changes the uh, orientation of the skin and you get different facial expressions. 
Um, it also draws the skin of the neck superiorly when the teeth are clenched. In terms of the blood supply, it's supplied by branches of the submental and suprascapular arteries. So the superior parts of this muscle toward the mouth, those are going to be supplied by the submental artery. The regions in the neck closer to the clavicle, those are going to be supplied by the suprascapular arteries, okay, branches that is. And then this muscle is innervated by the cervical branches of the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven. Okay, so that's our platysma. So let's keep going and look at letter D here. So D is this muscle right here. Now notice there's two Ds. We have a sternal head of this muscle right here, and then we have a clavicular head. So a two-headed muscle. This is called the sternocleidomastoid, and this actually happens to be the second muscle of the superficial layer of the anterior neck. So let's talk about the sternocleidomastoid. Now this is a two-headed muscle, but the two heads are actually considered the origin of the muscle. Okay? The origins are going to be the manubrium of the sternum and then the medial portion of the clavicle. We'll go ahead and look at that in just a minute. I want to also mention the insertion of this muscle. Both of these muscles are really going to more or less fuse superiorly, and they're going to insert really on the mastoid process of the temporal bone. We usually just say mastoid process. It's implied that it's on the temporal bone. It's also going to partly attach on the superior nuchal line, but mainly we consider the mastoid process. So if we look at this, we see this muscle has a sternal head, right? Here's the origin of the sternal head right here on the manubrium of the sternum. Whereas the clavicular head right here is originating on the clavicle, really the proximal part closest to the midline of the clavicle. But the fibers are going to run superiorly, and really these two heads actually fuse, and they insert right here. And this bone is actually the mastoid process, which is part of the temporal bone. So superiorly, the insertion is fused at the mastoid process. Inferiorly, these origins are separate. It's a two-headed muscle inferiorly. Okay? And for the sternocleidomastoid, it's supplied with blood via the occipital artery and the superior thyroid artery. Now the innervation of the sternocleidomastoid is threefold because the, it actually has motor, sensory, and proprioceptive functions. We normally only think of the motor functions. We'll talk about those in a minute. The motor innervation is via the spinal accessory nerve, or just accessory nerve. That's cranial nerve 11. The sensory innervation is via the cervical plexus, and the, the sternocleidomastoid also has proprioceptive function in terms of knowing where the neck is in space. That's very important for balance and that's provided via the C2 and C3 ventral rami. Now for the actions of the sternocleidomastoid, it depends on whether or not you're contracting one of them or both of them. If it's a unilateral contraction, and let's just say for the sake of argument that it's the left sternocleidomastoid, that's the left one in this image right here. If only the left sternocleidomastoid contracted, you're going to get contralateral cervical rotation. In other words, if the left sternocleidomastoid contracted, then you're going to rotate the head to the right. However, you're going to get ipsilateral cervical flexion. Okay? And really, this is more of a lateral flexion, uh, sort of a cross between flexion and lateral flexion. If one of these contracts, though, let's say the left sternocleidomastoid, then you're going to get cervical flexion and lateral flexion also to the left. Okay? So it depends on whether or not you're talking about flexion and lateral flexion or rotation of the neck. Okay? Now, if both of these muscles contract, you're going to get cervical flexion. Okay? So that means... Basically, your chin is going to go and touch your sternum. Okay? That's cervical flexion, if both of these contract at the same time. Also, during forced inhalation, so when you're actively inhaling, which might occur during exercise or if you have anxiety and you're stressed, okay, it's going to elevate the sternum and assist in forced inhalation. And yes, the origin is the manubrium, okay, but if you're forcefully inhaling, there's actually some elevation of the sternum, which helps open up the rib cage a little bit, increases the volume in the thoracic cavity, and you can take in more air during inhalation. Okay? One other thing about the sternocleidomastoid, I just got this picture right off of Wikipedia. Um, whenever you rotate your head in one direction, you can actually see the other sternocleidomastoid pretty well, assuming the body fat percentage is fairly low. So this woman right here is rotating her head to the left, okay, rotating it to the left. 
Notice you can see her right sternocleidomastoid right here pretty well. You can actually see its origin down here right on the manubrium. And if you were to actually follow up, palpate this up right to the insertion, you would actually get right to the mastoid process. Another thing about the sternocleidomastoid is that its name is based on its origins and insertions. Notice that it originates on the sternum and the clavicle. Clido usually refers to clavicle. So sternum and clavicle and then it inserts on the mastoid process. So even if you forget the origins and insertions, you can look at the name and kind of reason through that. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's continue with identifying some structures here. Letter E, right here. This muscle is gonna be sternohyoid. This makes sense because if we follow it inferiorly, we have here the it originates on the sternum, on the manubrium, and then it goes up and inserts on the hyoid bone, so sternohyoid. Letter G is right here. This muscle is thyrohyoid. So this structure right here in white, you can only see a little bit of it, this is the thyroid cartilage. And so this muscle right here is originating on the thyroid cartilage and inserting on the hyoid bone, so it's thyrohyoid. Letter H down here, this is actually going to be the inferior belly of omohyoid. So that means this right here, this would have to be the superior belly of omohyoid. So remember the superior belly and the inferior belly of omohyoid, they fuse at an intermediate tendon that's pretty much right here deep to the sternocleidomastoid. And that intermediate tendon is held in a fascial sling that's connected to the clavicle. So the clavicle has a fascial sling that comes off of it and holds the intermediate tendon of the omohyoid. So really when we talk about the, uh, the omohyoid, for the superior belly, its origin would be the intermediate tendon and its insertion to be the hyoid. For the inferior belly, its origin would be on the scapula back here and then its insertion would be the intermediate tendon which we cannot see. Okay. Now up here in the suprahyoid region, we have a similar type of muscle called the digastric. It has an anterior belly and a posterior belly right here. And the same kind of situation we have with the fascial sling, except the fascial sling would be coming off of the hyoid bone. But again, the anterior and posterior bellies are joined via an intermediate tendon, which of course is wrapped in that fascial sling, which you really can't see here. Okay, so here's our anterior belly of omohyoid, and then here's our posterior belly of omohyoid. Letter J, letter J right here, this would actually have to be stylohyoid. Okay, so this muscle is actually going to um, attach over here. We can't see the superior attachment, but it would attach on the styloid process, and then the inferior attachment down here is the hyoid. So it originates on the styloid process, inserts on the hyoid bone. Letter K. K is right here. This muscle is pretty much directly deep to the digastric muscle. This is going to be your mylohyoid muscle. Notice it's a broader muscle than really any of the other ones that we actually have in the suprahyoid region. So K is mylohyoid. We'll go down here, uh, really anterior to the levator scapulae, and we'll see the scalene muscles. So if we look at L first, right here, L is directly uh, posterior, or we could say deep, to the sternocleidomastoid clavicular head. This is our anterior scalene. Okay? Going directly backwards to M, this is our middle scalenes. And then down here, we can see a little bit of the posterior scalenes. And recall that between the anterior and middle scalenes, we'd have that interscalene space where we'd be able to see the brachial plexus coming through and also the subclavian artery. Okay. Notice it's strange that it's the subclavian artery, even though it's above the clavicle. It's just a weird thing, but again, it would come right between those two muscles. And then on this side, this is beneath the clavicle, but actually underneath the platysma. O is our pectoralis major muscle, and then P is the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. All right. So let's look at one more of these figures, and then we'll actually do the other two in another video, so I don't make this video too terribly long. We got the same kind of thing right here. So A is our trapezius muscle. We can even see the trapezius on this side. B, once again, here's our levator scapulae. Again, it's gonna come from some of the upper cervical vertebrae and descend down and insert posteriorly on the superior aspect of the medial border of the scapula. 
Now in this picture, the platysma has been removed. Notice in the previous picture that the platysma actually covers a little bit of the pectoralis major superiorly. Okay? Um, it's a very thin muscle, so it's still pretty easy to palpate the superior part of the, of the pectoralis major. But the superior part of the pectoralis major is covered and fused with a little bit of the platysma muscle. In this picture, the sternocleidomastoid has been cut. Okay, so on either side, here's our sternocleidomastoid. We can tell that because the insertion up here is on the mastoid process. Okay, but this muscle has clearly been cut. But the origins would be down here on the manubrium of the sternum and the proximal, or we could say medial part of the clavicle. E is the sternohyoid. Let's see if we can find that. E is right here. So this is our sternohyoid. Again, it's going to originate down here on the sternum, and then it's going to ascend up and insert on the hyoid, so sternohyoid. F, let's see if we can find that. F is right here. This would be the sternothyroid. Okay? So again, it originates down here on the sternum. Fibers ascend upward, and it's going to insert on the thyroid cartilage right here. So it's sternothyroid. This line right here, this is called the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. So one muscle is actually going to insert on this oblique line, and then this one, which we're actually about to look at, is going to originate on the oblique line. So this one right here was sternothyroid. G, directly above it, this is thyrohyoid. So it's going to originate on this oblique line of the thyroid cartilage, and then insert on the hyoid bone. So this is thyrohyoid. Again, make sense of the names. H, which is right here, okay, this is going to be your omohyoid. Now right here we can see that intermediate tendon of the omohyoid because this would be our superior belly. Down here is the inferior belly. Just remember, it's not visible here, but there would be a fascial sling coming from that clavicle that would wrap around the intermediate tendon and force the omohyoid into this bend right here. But notice that the superior belly does have its insertion on the hyoid bone. Letter I is our digastric muscle up here. It's a suprahyoid muscle. So here's a two-bellied muscle again, like omohyoid. Anterior belly is right here. Posterior belly is right here. And again, they're joined via that intermediate tendon, which is held in a fascial sling that's attached to the hyoid bone. Okay, so that's that's a digastric muscle. J, which is right here, this is our stylohyoid muscle again. It's going to originate sort of back here. You can't really see it on the styloid process. And then it's going to insert on the hyoid bone. K is shown right here, one on each side. Again, this is a broader muscle that's going to be posterior or deep, I should say, to the uh, digastric muscle. And this is going to be your mylohyoid muscle right here at K. Again, down here we have our scalenes. Okay. Um, L is going to be the anterior scalene, so we can actually see that right here. Now this anterior scalene muscle, remember, is posterior or deep to the sternocleidomastoid. Posterior to the anterior scalenes are the middle scalenes, M, and posterior to that would be the posterior scalenes, N. And posterior to that would be B, the levator scapulae. And then posterior to that would be the trapezius, at least back here. Again, O. Right here is our pectoralis major muscle, and P is the deltoid, okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of a lot of the muscles. We're bringing them back together from the anterior neck, and then also a little bit about the platysma and sternocleidomastoid, which are our superficial anterior neck muscles. In the next video, we're going to continue this pattern, and we're going to look at two other figures and hopefully get a really good understanding of these muscles. So hopefully this video made sense and gave you some good information about the uncovertebral joints. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.